it's good to be with you and it's good to, for me to go back and take a look at some of these issues because I I was in seminary in the late 90s. I finished up in the mid, mid to late 90s, 98. Um, and so some of these things have been off my radar, so to speak, for a while and going back and energizing myself again and picking some of the things up has been really fun. Um, I would tell you going in that the process of canon formation, how we got our Bibles, is a really messy one. And so sometimes that leads people to despair. Like there's a quote at the top of your page from Bart Ehrman, who is a professor at the University of North Carolina, um, a former evangelical, a graduate of Moody Bible Institute and Wheaton College, who subsequently left the faith and now is probably one of the faith's greatest critics. And he believes that there's the attempt to find uh, a coherent Bible is hopeless. So he says, if there is a God, it is certainly not the God of the Bible. That God is a Nazi deity. So he's, if you go to YouTube and punch in Bart Berman's name, he's going to be all over there. He's going to have debates and presentations. And, um, and a lot of kids, especially young people, go to college, especially ones who have been raised in the church and don't really have a good footing in biblical studies, broadly or nearly considered. They've just grown up with parents who read the Bible to them and thought that it was the Bible as they have it today is, is the Bible that has always been there and so forth. So um, it's, it can be kind of earth shattering to hear these things. Herman Bobbing uh, wrote his Reformed Dogmatics in the last century, but was a, a Dutch theologian who was really attuned to a lot of things that were happening in culture in general and in biblical studies, in particular in theological studies. And he was a very, very astute guy. He wrote many, many works in Dutch and Latin. He has a, a great quote at the top of the page there from his Reformed Dogmatics. There are two objections and conundrums problem, problems in every science. Those who do not want to start in faith will never arrive at knowledge. Those who do not want to embark on scientific investigation until they see the road by which they, we arrive at knowledge fully cleared will never start. Those who do not want to eat before they understand the entire process by which food arrives at their table will starve to death. And those who do not want to believe the word of God before they see all the problems resolved will die of spiritual starvation. So I would put it to you tonight that maybe that's a good place to start. That if we think, just imagine for a second that the infinite God decides to reveal himself to finite creatures. Just imagine what that will eventually look like. It won't be, and especially if you think of spanning a minimum of 2,000 years in multiple languages and cultures, it will not look like a straightforward, linear process. How would the infinite God give his mind, in some sense, to find the people? So oftentimes we think that we're going to have all the answers, even at the end of the process. I will promise you that some of you probably can think of a question tonight that I cannot answer for you. And that doesn't make me despair in the least. For what, when I look at my scriptures, I, I didn't bring an actual copy. I have a copy on my iPad. But if you hold up that Bible, it doesn't make me despair at all that the Bible is the Bible. It's the very word of God. So let's start in. I, I hope to give you three things tonight, three objectives. And I say tonight, I planned this as a one shot. The further I got into it, Ryan and I talked, it may involve a second class at some point. So we'll see how far we get. I want to leave time for you to ask questions as well. Feel free to jump in or ask me to pause as we go through this. It's not meant to be a talk at you the whole time. It would be great if we had some discussion. So first of all, I want to provide you a framework, and I hope you'll see that they are the lessons at a glance. Um, a framework within which to talk about biblical canon and terms. Uh, we probably will stay a little bit out of some of the weeds, simply because a good discussion of biblical canon at a, in an educational context could easily take several weeks uh, in class, and maybe an entire class, a semester-long class if you really wanted to go deep. You could actually get a PhD and, and never really leave the topic in your PhD studies of canon and text, and it's probably one of the most dis, um, language-heavy and analytical disciplines you can study at the graduate level in biblical studies. Very difficult. Uh, second, I hope to give you confidence. I don't want you to leave tonight without having a sense that God's Word is God's Word. Um, just because you don't have every answer doesn't mean you don't have the main answer. So uh, it'd be, uh, I want you to leave confident. Third, I want you to have humility. It does take, as evangelical Christians, we don't presuppose we have all the answers. 
but we do have enough of the answers and we want to be humble about what we don't know. Um, a quick example on that front. Years ago, I wish I had a map up here I could show you, but you can kind of picture the Mediterranean, picture Egypt about right here, and right above it is what? Who can tell me? The Red, you know, the Mediterranean, right? And you go up the if you go up the coast, you come up into Israel, and that route that we now know is what? In the Bible. What was that? The Exodus? The Exodus? So you go from Egypt up this way. What happened as Israel went into the promised land and left? Where did they actually go? Did they go up that route? They didn't actually. They went down here this way, and that was a place called Sinai. They traveled down deep in there, and they kind of went up the back way, and then they came around, and kind of in the back door, and came down. And scholars for years were puzzled by that account in the book of Exodus and said, there's no way the Bible is authentic and true, because there's no way you would go from here. We all know the shortest distance between two points of a straight line. There's no way you could from here to get here, and you can just simply go up the coastline. Why would you come down here and wrap all around and come back in the back way? Archaeologically, there wasn't any help. And finally, what we discovered was there was something we now know is called the Way of the Philistines. Archaeology, it took, it took years and years and years for archaeologists to excavate these areas and find out that the Philistines actually had military installations, if you will, all the way down that coastline. Makes sense because they were seafaring people. What did God do in giving people his people an alternative way around? Now, he could have just chosen to wipe out every military, military installation along the way, but he actually chose to kind of work within the culture and say, let's go around, let's go the long way, let's go down, down into Sinai, the wilderness. And of course, when you picture the Sinai wilderness in your mind, I hope you don't picture Michigan's wilderness. Right? Mm -hmm. You picture green trees. This is a desert, craggy, arid climate. He takes them down into there. Of course, we know what happens when they get in the wilderness. They grumble like we do, and they come back up. So we're learning spiritual lessons, but there actually is a reason that people were criticizing the authenticity of the Bible and its account without knowing the full story. We couldn't see yet. It took centuries for that to develop. Actually, two at least. So sometimes it's a story of just waiting, waiting for enough information, waiting on God to verify and validate his word. So we need to be humble. We know his ways are greater than our ways. And he says in the Westminster uh, Confession of Faith that he kept his word by singular care and providence and he kept it pure through all ages. But that doesn't mean that he kept it without any um, textual variance in the Bible, that you don't have an S missing from a word and not in, in the presence somewhere else. But he kept the fundamental uh, uh, message clear. Bart Ehrman, actually, we won't talk about it tonight, but Bart Ehrman is, on, you can go online and see this, he's in a debate with someone, I think it's Dan Wallace, of Dallas Seminary, he used to be at Dallas Seminary, and he actually agrees that out of the probably 500,000 or so textual variants in the Bible, half a million, there are only 130,000 words in the New Testament, I should say the New Testament, not the, not the Bible. Out of the 500, there's three times to four times the number of variants as there are words in the New Testament. And Urban agrees that not one single doctrine of the Christian faith depends on any of those variants. That there's not one thing in your belief system if you were a Christian that would change if those variants weren't there. So they're really small. I wish I could show you a picture of a, a papyrus or something. You could see the, the letters. I, I debated to do that tonight, but we don't have the time probably to pass out the piece to you and have you copy it and see how many mistakes you make at the end of the page. Uh -huh. That'll be kind of an interesting uh, process to work through. So I hope you have humility. Let's quickly look at the overview, the six parts of our discussion. We're going to look at the problem of canon, which I will suggest is not ultimately a problem, but a problem at least at face value. If we don't have a canon, what else don't we have? I'm going to take a stab at answering that question. If we don't have a reliable canon that we know we can verify in some sense and trust, what else don't we have? Assurance that it's from God, it's from God, it's, it's God for you. Yeah, so we don't have assurance, maybe inspiration and it's errant, it's without error. What else might, if we don't have that, we can keep taking steps backward, right? What else don't we have? We also we don't have a basis, a credible basis for our faith. We don't have a credible basis for the faith, we don't have 
forgiveness of sins. And our forgiveness of sins, what do we not have? Salvation. Our salvation, we don't have a life in Christ. So that's an argument that keeps stretching back, back, back. And that's why Bart Ehrman and others like him have started to criticize, unhelpfully at times, asking God to say, unless you're willing to meet me on my terms, I'm going to abandon the faith. And they end up abandoning the faith because it's just kind of an infant regression of doubt and skepticism. Also, that's, that's worth saying at the outset, um, before we go too much further, is that our particular culture, for the last 200 years or so, most of you probably... Uh, have some experience studying the Enlightenment. Maybe it was back in college day, maybe it was a graduate program, but you know what the Enlightenment is. A prized certainty. Not just moral certainty, but scientific certainty. You had to know down to point oh 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 oh, you know, kind of very mathematical certainty, we might say. And so you come into debates like this or issues like this kind of leaning in one direction or the other. You kind of come in saying, either the Bible, I think, credibly is the Word of God, or it's not, and you come in doubting and skeptical of that. And there's nothing wrong with it. If your background isn't in the Christian church and you don't, you've not heard these things before, but culturally speaking, um, they might be akin to, um, did anybody watch the debates last night? The debate? Yeah, you know, you're sick of by that sort of. So if you, if you said kind of like, ah, oh, politics, yeah. uh, uh, no, that, that's skepticism. You're skeptical about what politics will do. Someone said, no, you've lost hope in the savior of America, the political system. Most of us would probably say, what planet are you living on? <laughs> this is not how I think about politics today. People at times, you realize the 1950s or the 1930s or whatever, have much, much greater confidence that their leaders were true leaders, that they could help in society and so forth. Culturally, they were leaning positively towards politics in a good way. Now we're sort of leaning against it. Where is the Bible in terms of that leaning? What's the culture at large say? This is not credible. This isn't believable. It's an ancient document. It's misogynistic. It's patriarchal. It's, it's the, you know, everything we would imagine to be. Only someone without a brain would believe in something we call the Bible. So we began to say in the, in the 18th century, we began to say, revelation is bad. Uh, reason is good. And that's a... Reason is good. It's a gift from God. But revelation is absolutely critical. General revelation and creation around us speaks truly, and God's special revelation. So we'll talk about that. The definition of canon, what, uh, what is a working definition of canon? I'm going to suggest that probably it's not great to put all our eggs in one basket into one single definition, and that the date of the canon in particular depends greatly on how you define canon, and that conversely, um, the date will affect how you define the canon. It shouldn't say the reason for reason. Sorry about that. This is the reason for canon. Um, why do we need a Bible at all? I suggest there's really just two responses. Either we do or we don't. Uh, not, not terribly complex. Then the date of the canon, the authors of the canon, the attributes of canon. And we'll go through each of those one by one. So let's start with the problem of canon. So... Anybody have heard of Nag Hammadi? Nag Hammadi in Egypt? My daughter in the back has somewhere in her education she heard of Nag Hammadi. So Nag Hammadi, there was a Bedouin who was roaming the hillside and eventually found texts, found scrolls that revealed um, a new set of documents to us. These are all comparatively late Christian documents, meaning second century onward, second century AD. But in 1945, we found kind of a cache of new documents. Do you know what other documents were found about the same time? Yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? So that gave us further information. We literally were finding scrolls of Isaiah in particular, but lots of other biblical books that we didn't even know existed. And scholars for a long time doubted the, the veracity of the Bible and the credibility of the Bible. They simply didn't have any resources to prove them. Dead Sea Scrolls and other things like that have really helped us in that um, the Gospel of Thomas, which is probably the most prominent uh, book from that, from that cache that's out there, um, is a book, like others, that's Gnostic. Do you know what Gnosticism is? Have you heard that term before? Yeah, it's really means knowledge. They were trying to go ahead and um, speak that the physical and the spiritual separate, and they were trying to hijack Christian principles, and John spoke against them. 
Yeah, the Greek word, Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, just means knowledge. So the idea was that you need to possess some secret knowledge that was only available to the spiritually insightful, those who had been given that insight. And those were people who would have salvation of some sort. It wasn't the purview of every person and common people. So these documents were Gnostic, and I have a quote there, on the day you see the light of your own true self, you'll, re you'll rejoice. Do you see Jesus saying something like that? It doesn't look like something Jesus would say. And we'll get to that later in terms of orthodoxy, but the Gospel of Thomas is what's kind of driving and underlying Dan Brown's work, for example. If you've seen Dan Brown's work, Angels and Demons and Da Vinci Code and all those kind of things. Um, the various Gospels. Many doubt the authorship of New Testament books, and that's actually somewhat of a common practice today, especially for Paul, to question whether or not Ephesians was written by Paul, the pastoral epistles, or the prison letters were written by Paul and Second Peter. So many have said that it's problematic to try to get at a canon when we don't even know who these authors really were. Right? There's just too much fragmentation. Of course, those, those books themselves have been vetted, if you will, by biblical scholars for many years and found to be faithful representations of this or that, but people today roundly criticize them. The Gnostic Gospels themselves, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Jesus' wife have also become popular. Um, and then Walter Bauer wrote in the 1930s, uh, Walter Bauer incidentally was a Nazi, a member of the Nazi party, but was a New Testament scholar, wrote Orthodoxy and Heresy in Early Christianity, and what he argued for was that in the early century, the first several centuries of Christianity, it wasn't so much Christianity that we were looking at, but it was multiple Christianities. Christianity is plural. So we just happened, you know how they say that the victors write the history books? So really what we got was the people who kind of won the debates at councils, won the theological debates of the time, but there were other people who had other Christianities. And so what he tried to do was harken back and say there are these other forms of Christian faith some of which are reflected, like in the Gospel of Thomas, that probably for him, he wasn't terribly theological about the whole thing, and I don't know if he really had a dog in the hunt, so to speak, but he was at least saying, this is my broad perspective. He's actually been fairly discredited at this point, even secular scholarship. So if we say, if we don't have a coherent New Testament, uh, and I'm going to combine most of my remarks in this, in this lesson to the New Testament, not the Old Testament. The Old Testament canon is relatively stable in terms of what people know happened by Jesus' day. It's the New Testament canon is so hotly debated. So if we don't have a New, if we have a New Testament, we don't have a New Testament message of no message, we don't have a gospel message, in no gospel message you have theological liberalism, which that's not meant to be a jab, that's meant to just be anti-supernaturalism. That means that we don't have a Bible that actually is the product of divine inspiration. What we have is a record of human beings writing things down. We'll touch on that in just a second. And the, comp, the further comment would be, if we don't have that, if we don't have the gospel, then you and I are just like it says in 1 Corinthians 15, we're dead in our sins and trespasses. So it's, it's a one time kind of an academic debate, but another level is profoundly spiritual because if we don't have a Bible, we, you and I don't know what God has said. We don't, certainly don't know the message of redemption. So let's try to briefly kind of look at having some definitions of canon. Do you want to take a stab just yourselves at what the definition of a canon might be? You may know what the word canon means, for example, originally. It's not like we just grabbed a word out of thin air and started using it. What does canon mean? Anybody know? It just means a rule, like a rule. And eventually came metaphorically being a list of books. Have you heard of the Western canon? when you go to college, you read the books in the Western canon. But originally, the word canon in Greek just meant a rule, like literally like a rule. <coughs> so you, you basically said, these are the books I want, you measured them, this was, what does it even have to do with books originally? So if you had to define a biblical canon, it came to mean this list of books that were going to be included. Now, the early Christians did not, there's no evidence that they had a sense of what we now call canon. We'll get to that now. Sorry. i make sure. My kids are going to make me, my students here will make me put this up somewhere. Yeah. Hang it up yeah. or something like that. Okay, so um, there's been a lot of scholarship recently kind of arguing, because of people like Bart Ehrman, 
new uh, evangelical scholars have been forced to kind of go back to the drawing board and kind of say, is this really the best way to conceive of these things? And some people have been critical about the old definitions of canon, which is kind of a list of books of the Bible. So canon's not properly, if you, if you were to go back and say, um, just like orthodoxy was being challenged and tested in the early church, 325 AD was the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea established what we would now call the doctrine of the Trinity. Does that mean that no one had a doctrine of the Trinity before then? Until the fourth century, no one believed in a Trinity? Was God not triune before that? No, it was just that challenges kept coming, and then you gotta remember that this was before the internet, before all these kind of things. How did people even know that there was another Christian community, you know, 100 miles away or 500 miles away, or it took time for all this thing to develop? which is one of the things we've got to be careful of, is we don't read back our modern assumptions into the first century or the second century or the fourth century, even about how the canon was formed. It took a long time to organically develop. It doesn't mean that people didn't know what God said in the meantime. It took a while for it to come completely cohere. So there's one definition of the exclusive canon, which says canon is a fixed, final, closed list. And that's usually how we talk about it. We think of it as this list of books. There's a sense in which we, for Protestants at least, we didn't really have a final canon until the Reformation. We were still kind of arguing this out to some degree in the church with Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, and Protestantism. So it's not until then we finally get a sense that we're saying no to these books, namely what we call the Deuterocanonical books or the apocryphal books as a Protestant, which by the way, we're most Protestants view those as entirely appropriate to read. They weren't like banned books that you couldn't read. These were just books that weren't authoritative for the life of the church. The Westminster Confession of Faith says that these are not to be accorded any more than any other book, a book by C.S. Lewis or something like that. It's fine. It could be fully orthodox. It's just not inspired. Okay, so that's, that's one definition. And then the functional canon was a canon was formed when the books of the New Testament, in some sense we have a we have some sense that they were used as scripture. So for example, does anybody know when the Gospels were approximately written? Well, let me ask you this. I'm giving some kind of notification. Anybody know when the Gospels or the Le Pauline letters were written? 40 to 60 AD. Yeah, so in the, 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 which was first, letters or Gospels? Letters. Letters, right. So most people think the Gospels were first because they're canonically first. Um, but that's not actually true. So, um, so yeah, the, the letters were first probably as early as about 48 to 50 AD. When do we assume Jesus lived? Yeah, so he probably was crucified in the third uh, decade. So how far is that between probably Galatians, probably one of the earliest letters, and Jesus' own life? That's like our lifetime, and we're still well within 30 years. This isn't 200 years later, 300 years later, or something like that. This is very close. The gospel accounts are written probably in the 70s, 80s, 90s, somewhere in that time. I don't know how you date some of these things. So canon, those, those New Testament letters, become used in the church immediately, very early. They're circulating, and there's, as we'll see in a sec, there's ample indication that when people receive them, they receive them as God's word. They do not receive them as advice. They saw them as just like the Old Testament. We'll see that in just a second. And thirdly, there's this idea of an ontological canon. Ontology is this big fancy the uh, philosophical word that has to do with essence. So an ont ontological canon. This just means that there's a canon. The, the canon are the books that God gave to his church. So if we look at all the, these three definitions, kind of, kind of take them almost like you would facets of a diamond and think we've got to form this kind of, uh, as I say, they are multi-perspectival dimensional definition. So God gave books to his church, which began to be, which the church began to use those books, and then eventually the church reached consensus with each other in a list. Now keep in mind as the gospel, one of the things you see in the book of Acts is the word of God goes forth in power in preaching. So people start going to all places around. And that's good. That's a verbal proclamation of the word of gospel. 
but how then do you come up with, what if this community over here doesn't get access to a letter as fast as this one does over here? How do you begin to kind of pull all these things together? I mean, God's not troubled by any of that, but we would be. We would think, how do we bring all these Christians together who are becoming Christians, the Spirit of God is dwelling in these people, how do we bring them together? Well, eventually it's a process of bringing together the authoritative teaching of the apostles in some sense. But it takes time. It takes time to develop. Let me pause there and see if there are any questions. Can you stop? Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like, for Christians like us, we would die for books like Ephesians and uh, First and Second Peter. We hold those to be true. Are there like sects of Christianity that are just, like they are holding tight to uh, the Gnostic Gospels and the Apocrypha and they're willing to, to die to say those are for true? That's or pretty rare. That's a great point. Um, I'm trying to think of the name right now. Aren't uh, Karen, maybe Karen Armstrong, I think, the professor at Harvard Divinity School, who recently, she's written a book on the Gnostic Gospels, and she, she went on the news and so forth and said, we've just found another document that confer, confirms a lot of what we believe about this thing or that thing, only to find out, I think about a year later, there was a forgery. So she was probably the preeminent Harvard University scholar of Gnostic Christianity, and people then said, if she can't figure out if it's a forgery or not, we don't have a lot of confidence. And there were all kinds of forgeries in the first century and second century, really second, third century more. So no, a, that's a very interesting question, which is, you know, what are you willing to die for, right? Um, I'm not aware of any. Now there are, um, there are people who have deuterocanonical books, what we call the Apocrypha and Protestantism, who would say that's part of the Bible, but nobody who's hanging on these so-called Christian scriptures, uh, Christian, I don't know if they would put it that way, um, which have these outlandish stories in them. So Jesus is supposed to be like 200 feet tall and comes out in the resurrection, he's 200 feet tall, and outlandish things. I'll, I think I have some things here at the end of the handout that I can read to you. So no, not to my knowledge. Any other questions? Okay. We'll have time, we'll take time at the end too, to, to circle back and hit some of these issues. The reason for Cain. The reason for Cain, for the scholarly community today, would essentially be there isn't one. So, the texts were written in the first century, and most people agree that the books, if they are willing, are willing to agree at all that they're genuine, that the books that we attribute to our canon were written in the first century, but later co-opted, by the church bureaucrats with vested interests, theological interests, to push their own agendas. So what they did is they said, the Gospel of Thomas is, prefer is less preferable to this Christian community because of some reason. Right? They were open, uh, now, of course, what's, what's kind of identity politics is behind some of this, is that the first century documents, Apostle Paul in particular, was deeply misogynistic. So we'd love to find documents that aren't as misogynistic. What's telling is that some of the documents they have, in fact, seem way more, if you were going to call Paul misogynistic, then some documents would be way more misogynistic than Paul ever was judged to be. So the early, earliest Christians had no need for a canon. They simply got inspiration, much like we said, um, the idea that there would be some time where we'd pull all this together and take all of God's revelation. If God actually orchestrated this in terms of bringing his revelation together, they say there's no need for You just had early preaching. What you did is you had a bureaucratic uh, form of church government that kind of came in and said, we've got to form uh, a theological foundation to push our Christology uh, and other doctrines. The, the, even a doctrine that Jesus himself is God. There's that line you hear frequently that Jesus never claimed to be God. You may have a good response to that, by the way. If someone tells you Jesus never claimed to be God, You'd ask them if they read the Bible because they were missing it. What's that now? Sorry. You should ask them if they read the Bible because they clearly missed a lot of uh, a lot of his comments. So, so do you have an example you can throw out? Uh, I think one of the most striking ones is his consistent use of the term son of man, which mm -hmm. the uh, audience would have understood as a reference to Daniel. Yeah. And the vision of the man entering the throne room and receiving authority from God. Ancient only son of man, right? Good. 
That's great. So I would put it to you that you need you need responses like that, right, in your back pocket. I think one of my favorites is, is Johnny, where he's Jesus is is talking to the Jews, the Pharisees at the time, and they, they, they're talking about who's who's the rightful child of Abraham, and he says, I can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. So it's kind of a Jew-Gentile debate for a while, and then he says, um, he says, I can raise them up, and, these stones I can raise them up. And, and then they talk about, uh, who are you to tell us, you know, who are you to talk about Abraham? And he says, before Abraham was, I am. Right? And in Greek, ego and me, he actually he should say, before Abraham was, I was. Past tense. He uses actually the name of God in there. And what do you remember the Jews' response? They're going to stone him. So if they would have just said, oh, this guy's a nut. Right? That's what we're typically told. No, they actually want to stone him for claiming to be divine. Now again, that's not the same thing as saying, in modern terminology, I'm God. But how kind of weird is it for us to take our contemporary conviction or assessments of how we would say we were God and read them back onto the first century? There's a great book called The Art of Biblical Narrative by Robert Alter, who's not a Christian, he's a Jewish man. But he looks at that. Have you ever heard someone talk about the maybe questioning the authenticity of the Old Testament and saying things about like the Bible permitted polygamy? We, can't, we don't like it because it, it actually more than permits, it might endorse polygamy. And can't, that can't be right. He goes through the Old Testament to show that the patriarchs in particular from, he's a scholar of Hebrew, he's a comparative literature scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. And he says, you can't read this text in Hebrew and come away with anything else other than the early chapters of Genesis, the whole book of Genesis, is making fun of polygamy. This, this is a hugely problematic issue. Because what happens when people take more than one wife? Disaster. Right? This isn't good in any way. So does the Bible have to come out and say, we don't like polygamy, God hates polygamy, to say that it's not supportive of that at all? So it's, it's really an issue of literary criticism at that point. But it takes some subtlety to get there. Kids especially can be easily fooled, and even adults, by those kinds of writings. We just haven't taken the time to read our Bibles contextually and carefully. For the evangelical, though, what, what is the reason for a canon? The well, canon was, what we'll, we'll argue, was, the innate, was innate, organic, and inevitable. It should have been totally expected. That is, it didn't surprise anyone to get a canon to something. It wasn't like we decided these people were just going and writing notes down and they collected index cards or the equivalent and they came up with a Bible. This had to be this way. And if we have some, if people have some Bibles, we could read a few verses. If you have something, you have, I see a Bible over here, or maybe a sweet, or look up a few things. A few Bibles, okay. So we'll get to this in a second. First of all, let's look at three doctrinal commitments that the, that the hearers of Jesus and the early Christians would have had that would have told them a canon is coming. First, Jesus finished the Old Testament story. He didn't begin a new one. Jesus finished the Old Testament story. So, do you see why it's problematic, as well-intentioned as the mistake may be, to have those Bibles and hotels, which are the New Testament and the Psalms and Proverbs? Because what does that say? That's all you need. What's that? Who said it? It implies that that's all you need. Yeah, it's all you need, and we wouldn't take, you know, a novel, rip it in half, <laughs> give you the second half of it, and say, yeah, you, you jump it in halfway, you're not going to get the story. So you have to read the Old Testament. Jesus comes alive in the, in dramatic fashion when you actually understand Leviticus, for example. When you when you picture years ago, I heard someone do a study on this and stuck with me ever since. When you picture yourself coming with your daily sacrifice, and you picture you just killed an animal and you're covered in blood. And it's, you know what an animal smells like after you've just killed it? And you come to the priest, and what is the priest covered in? He's been anointed. Oh. He smells good. He has, he has things over him. You give him, you give this, and he's, he's, the aroma of the priesthood is now in his nose. He gets to say there's a sacrifice, a sweet-smelling aroma. Then the, then the animal's burned, 
And what is he now associating? Redemption for him means this painful thing had to happen. I take some of my own animals, devote them to sacrifice, but now the priest, who's washed clean and standing in these gar mm -hmm. garments and smells nice, is my salvation. Now when you come to the New Testament, you read passages that talk about Jesus that way, as the great high priest. You could somehow put yourself in the first century and have a very different read of those passages. Hebrews kind of jumps off the page of it, right? So he's not just kind of a, a, a different story. He's continuing the story. How does Matthew begin? Matthew's gospel. Genealogy. Genealogy. Right? So he's beginning. Does anybody know what the last book of the Jewish canon was? It wasn't We Are Rivals. Malachi, right? It's not, it's not Malachi. The last book would have been Chronicles. And Chronicles ends with a genealogy. genealogy. Right? So we have genealogy to genealogy, this connection that we miss a lot of times in our reading. So he's continuing the story. Second, though, he didn't just, that's not one, the only thing, he inaugurates a new covenant. And we all probably know that, especially if you've been in a Presbyterian church for any length of time, you know he inaugurates a covenant. He says, This is a new covenant in my blood. Exodus 24 7. So I'm going to take a uh, uh, to read that? Mm -hmm. Exodus 24, 7. Sure. We'll read a couple of these. And maybe someone could do 2 Kings 23, 2. Do that one. Exodus 24, 7. Okay. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So what you have here is an exodus. God's just revealed himself on the top of Mount Sinai, his mm -hmm. law. And he's not content to just speak, right? He wants this chiseled in to stone, granite. He wants a book of the covenant. Have that there. Inscripturated revelation in some way. The next passage was 2 Kings 23, 2. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests, the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. Okay. So there you go, another book of the covenant. You could, we could go on and on and on. Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 29. Whenever God reveals himself and speaks to his prophets, he's in the business also of substantiating that in written form. Now, what's the biggest difference between the Old Testament's written form and what you and I have? How we've got it written on our hearts. Sorry? How we've got it written on our hearts. Yeah, right. So and 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 we don't do we have don't have personal we have personal copies, right, that they didn't have. So even in the time of the Middle Ages, actually, I'm thinking of like your mother, my my mother in law, grew up in a theological tradition where she we were told we really shouldn't read the Bible. What's that mean to tell someone they shouldn't read the Bible? That only the professionals can read the Bible. It's a terrible thing, a dangerous thing. It doesn't mean that you don't need tools to read the Bible well, but it doesn't mean everybody should be reading it. The third doctrinal commitment they have is God gave special revelatory authority to the apostles through Jesus. So Jesus' ministry was he himself was prophetic, and then he passed along that prophetic gift to his disciples, to his apostles. So the apostles had an authoritative ministry. You could not say to the apostles, sorry Paul, sorry Peter, we disagree, we're not going to do what you say. Today, and for many years, the, the Pope in Roman Catholic theology speaks as the vicar of Christ on earth. He speaks as an apostle. Not all the time, so there's a distinction made between, you know, he says, uh, I don't think that capitalism is good, something like that. They have a category for how he speaks in that when he speaks ex cathedra, from the chair in Latin, when he speaks in his capacity as the vicar of Christ, then he, he speaks like the Apostle Paul would. And, and you disobey him, disagree with him, and if you do, that's called moral sin. You should have no expectation of salvation if you do that. So it's a, it's a very important thing. Let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Do we have someone read that quickly? 2 Thessalonians 2.15. A whole passage in Thessalonians. There's more. 
And we've got 2 Thessalonians 3, 14. So then, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by epistle of ours. Okay, so there you've got either our spoken word or our letters, in my translation. You, you're, you're obeying these things. Spoken word or our letters. So we're speaking authoritatively, we're writing authoritatively. And then 2 Thessalonians 3, 14. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Okay, so if you don't obey what's in this letter, it's not good. It's just advice. It's actually God's little word. So right from the beginning, we see this binding character of revelation. Okay? Let me, um, we've got about, 15 minutes here. Let me see if I can quickly go over this, the fourth, the David canon. And all I want to do is kind of hit some highlights here. You, I've given you some extra data that I normally don't include. Option one, <coughs> option two, uh, and then first century, or early first century, and then the first century. So what I'm trying to do there is to say, you see how if we were to define canon as um, when the canon was, was being put together, as as late as 200. Now keep in mind, the Gospel of Thomas is dated to 200. That's a, that's a Gnostic Gospel. All the Gnostic Gospels are in that 2nd century, 3rd century, late. The only documents we have from the 1st century um, are the ones in our Bible. Okay. So as early as Irenaeus of Rome, 180, he has all of the Gospels, all of Paul, about 22 of the 27 books, right? 22 of the 27 books. In, the, in option two, late second century, the Mur Muratorian Fragment, which is our early, earliest canonical list. The other ones were just making references, Irenaeus is referencing the book here and the book there, all in different places. We have a list, actually, as early as 180. Um, what's remarkable here is that when you put together a list, it not only implies what you're writing down, it implies an ex a principle of exclusion. But there's other things that aren't being included. They're not in there. What if there were Gnostic Gospels floating around? They're just not included. Now, it's possible you could say, well, maybe they didn't know about them. But chances are probably very slight. The, the, the early church knows about these things. They talk about forgeries. They know that there are people writing things that don't conform to apostolic teaching. They even know that there are orthodox writings that are fully orthodox that don't come from the apostles' hand that they describe. And so we don't include those either. So there you have four Gospels, Acts, Paul, all 13 of Paul's letters, Jude, John 1 through 3, and Revelation. And there are books like Hebrews that in all of our lists and early on are, are, are just questioned, right? In the beginning. There's at least some part of the church that's unsure about them. So in terms of consensus building, it takes longer for those to be included. Early first century, Justin Martyr, writing out of Rome in 150-ish, received the four Gospels. He called them Memoirs of the Apostles and other uh, reliable historical records. These memories, or these memoirs, were read publicly. And the quote is, On the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gathered together in one place, and the memoirs of the Apostles, the writings of the prophets, which would have been the Old Testament, are read as long as time permits, then the president or the preacher verbally instructs the imitation of these good things. That's as early as 150. But you have that clearly a case that the Gospels are the four Gospels that we know. Papias, the Bishop of Hierapolis in 125, he talks about this fellow called the Elder, which we see in 2nd and 3rd John. Now look at the date, 125. We typically date the Johannine Letters, the Gospel of John, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, to the very end of the 1st century, the book of Revelation, as late as 96 or 98 AD. So what's that mean for Papias and this elder? They probably were in touch with each other. So he's taking something from the elder, which we judge to be John, uh, the, the writer of the, of the letters. In the New Testament, the Apostle John was called the Elders of the Information in 98. 
Ignatius of Antioch, around 100. He has a Pauline collection, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Not all of them, but many of them. And then, of course, in first century, probably most powerful, 2 Peter 3.16. What I have in bold print there is probably one of the most powerful arguments, I think, for an early sense of canon. Peter quotes, is writing, write, writing his letter, and 2 Peter is often thought not to be canonical. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be. There are some things in, in Paul's letters that are hard to understand. Peter says that some things in Paul are hard to understand. Are you glad to hear that? <laughs> I am which the ignorant and unstable twist their own destructions as they do the other scriptures. What other scriptures? Wait a minute. Peter's calling Paul's letter other scriptures? Very telling. Paul, Paul is scripture. This is mid-60s. Okay? Peter assumes familiarity with Paul's letters, plural. It's not just one letter. 1 Timothy 5.8, Paul gives us a double quotation from the Old Testament and the Gospel, both Scripture. It says, for the Scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox which treads out the grain, simple enough, Deuteronomy 25. Then he says, the laborer deserves his wages. And the only place the laborer deserving his wages occurs is in the Gospels. Right? So there's some, we know, that the Gospels are written later, but have an oral tradition that's much, much earlier, right after Jesus. Most of you probably have heard that when you look at which gospel was written first, most people believe that Mark was written first, and that Matthew and Luke bear a striking resemblance to each other. And there's something over here on the side people identify called Q, which is the German word for source, or uh, symbolizes well, which means source in German. So I believe that they've got Mark. Do you remember the gospel of Mark? Do you remember how fast Mark moves? He's always like straightforwardly, quickly, using these words, and he goes right through the gospel account, right through Jesus' life in 16 chapters. Luke and Luke is 24, Matthew is 28, and it takes a lot more discourses, more time, less, no teaching in Mark, just really down. So Mark has over here, and then Matthew and Luke over here, having Q, this source tradition that he's joining from. Is that problematic for Christians to believe in their sources? Of course not. They're sources. They're not, we don't view them as a scripture of revelations. We don't have them. We don't know what they were exactly. But Jesus died, and there were still people talking, talking about his teaching, and orally passing things down. Believe it or not, we have this debate all the time today with our kids about writing things down versus you know, digital technology and everything. Would it surprise you to know that in the early church, and in antiquity, I should say, people were really skeptical about writing? But they thought that it was better to actually memorize everything. Which is more reliable, actually. Now we look at that and think, are you crazy? <laughs> but now studies are coming out to show us even when you type something on your computer, like notes, you tend to focus on writing every word that you hear. What are you not doing if you do that? Not paying attention to the content. You're like a transcriptionist. So another telling young people to say, instead of typing notes, you should be listening, handwriting notes, not verbatim, but summarizing as you go, organizing your thoughts, and not trying to have an exact replication of what you wrote. You'll actually know the material better the other way. I don't like that as much as I'm going to tell you. That's what they say. So let me hit the pause button there and ask you if you have any questions, because I think we're, we're getting close to time. And I'm happy to stay around a little bit more to continue to cover some things, uh, to continue to answer questions, but I think child care and things like that, we need to make sure we're in time for that. So it is 726, we've got about four minutes. Yeah? Uh, maybe I misheard you, I thought I was embarrassed to ask. Really early on, you listened to listing books. Did you say a book written by the white people? Did that what you Yeah. Not one of ours, obviously, but one of the Gospels. The Gospel of the Life of Jesus. Did you say a little bit more about that? I'm sorry? Did you say a little bit more about that? Well, I, I, I don't know if I could tell you a lot. Um, let me go back here. Uh, I've not actually read it myself. It's, it's very common today to think, um, it's, well, I shouldn't say it's common, it's not uncommon in certain university circles and so forth among scholars to wonder if a Jesus was, of course, married. And that's part of Dan Brown, these Gnostic Gospels, which came out in 
gospel of Jesus' life. Um, it's also not uncommon to wonder if Jesus was uh, gay, homosexual. And they take that from where in the Bible? What particular part? They, people speculate and say, sounds like he had some love for someone here. Sounds, sounds gay to us. The disciple who Jesus loved. Precisely, John, the beloved disciple. That's right. So, let me see here. Uh, so I was doing some research. I came across a couple of interesting... Uh, Okay, so apologize. I see. Um yeah, I don't see. I thought I had some notes written down about that particular issue, but I think I knew it. So yeah, the white uh, assume he was married and that this was um, one of the great tensions in the church, in the literature, was something called dos uh, heresy, it's called docetism. And that, uh, to dokeo means to appear or seem in Greek. So the idea was that when we think about scripture, even, there's one error that would lie primarily on the side of, of evangelical Christianity, and one that would appear on the side of so called liberal Christianity. And one would deny Jesus' divinity, and one would deny his humanity. So some people have said, you Christians were uncomfortable with the idea that Jesus had a wife and kids and lived a normal life just like everybody else. And we're not uncomfortable with that in theory. It's just that that's not what the text seems to indicate at all. And would that be problematic for Jesus to have a wife and kids, theologically? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there, there'd be issues. Um, what about him not being divine? There are a lot of issues. A lot of issues here. And so what we have is Orthodox Christology, which kind of comes and gets codified in 451 of the Council of Chalcedon, which said Jesus was fully man, fully God. They actually spent a long time at that council in Chalcedon, in Asia Minor, in Turkey, it's now Turkey. And after many, many months of debating, all they could say at the end was, fully God, fully man. So at that point, we said there are mysteries that we cannot push too far into. That's what we can say. So in that case, Jesus having a wife and kids and all these things, is problematic, but not because it's because it's not in the text of scripture, it's this other text that people are saying, like similar texts, and I wish I could find it. Maybe we'll, uh, let me see if I can, because there's a couple that we could jump ahead. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So, in the Gospel of Thomas, Mary, at the end of it, in, in uh, saying 114, Peter and Mary are discussing something, Jesus interrupts and Simon Peter says to the apostles, let Mary leave, because women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, look, I will leave her so that I will make her a male, so that she will also become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who makes herself a male will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's from the Gospel of Titus. The Gospel of Judas says, you need to betray me. This is Jesus talking to Judas. You need to betray me, but in doing so, you will be a hero, because you will set me free from my shell. So that's platonic. That's Gnostic. But I think, are you asking like that's those are those were books people were trying are trying to say should be included in our Bible, right. and we're like, no, no, no. Even though we say Gospel of Thomas, that's what they call it. It's not. Right. We are. It's not a. It's not the Gospel of. But I misunderstand your question. No. Okay. 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 Oh, don't be surprised that you say that. Surprise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hey, I just read a great book on all this. It's called The Shortest Leap. It's a wonder. It's huge. So you have to pick and choose anyway. So. The Shortest Leap? The Shortest Leap. A woman, and, and actually, a Gideon Bible, which is only the New Testament in the world, did you say? Yeah. It, in France, she picked it up, or whatever, Italy, and she just started reading it just to improve her Italian, and the Lord changed her heart. So I know you're saying Well, no, no. Mom. I think the Gideon Bibles do have the Old Testament. Yeah. Oh, okay. But sometimes you get the little Psalms and uh, Proverbs, New Testaments in there. Right. Well, well, I'm thinking of a little green thing. Yeah. <laughs> Not the brown Bibles that you have kept many people probably alive and on this planet <laughs> over the years. So let's let's take a pause button there. Hit hit pause button.
And I think the plan is maybe in a couple weeks for, for it to come back and kind of finish this out. Um, so on, maybe if you take this handout with you, on the last page, there's 10 facts every Christian should know about camping. And maybe that's a good way to kind of leave off. Just, just read over those 10 facts and think about them. They might, some of them might surprise you, and others of them may not. Um, so I leave, I, maybe we'll, we'll close with that today and come back. And we'll, we'll cover the rest of the material and also maybe talk a little bit about text types and some other things next time that will give you a better sense for how the New Testament actually works. And I apologize if I, it was advertised as Bible. That would be, if we went Old Testament, that would be more, it would take weeks to get through something like that. This is a kind of belonging to the facts, the Sunday. But I hope you can see that even now we're trying to give you that framework to understand things, answer some of these questions. If you decide to get in the weeds, which is a worthy study, it just means you're going to have to become familiar with a lot of different terminologies. Like if I said, I want to understand the basis of string theory, <laughs> right? You'd say, I don't know if that's going to be an easy 40-minute introduction. You're going to have to have some prerequisites before you do that. <clears throat> some basic physics would help, right? Okay. Well, let me pray for us, and then we'll discuss. Lord God, we, we aim tonight to exalt you and exalt your word, which Psalm 138 tells us is what you are doing. So allow us to imitate you and having great confidence in what you say is true and not be like, not be an unbelief, uh, live in unbelief where we question. Give us good confidence to know that what you have told us in scripture is in fact true and to be believed and to be acted upon. And give us good words to say to our unbelieving friends and neighbors who may question, having heard these things passed around in society, but not really investigated for it. Give us ready answers to help them see the truthfulness of Jesus Christ, who is himself the canon, the true canon. It's in his name we pray. Amen.